we began the year by exploring the history of the Americans and the indigenous communities who lived and who continue to live here. One of our first assignments was to research the specific land we stand on. Before we begin our, we begin our program today, we would like to take a moment to honor the indigenous individuals and communities who have been living and working on this land since time immemorial. Roof and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. Those of us who are not, who are not zooming in from elsewhere, that is, those of us who are on the country school campus in Madison, Connecticut, are standing on the ancestral lands of the Wapinger, Hamanassets, and Quinnipiac. Please take a moment to honor these individuals and communities, past and present, as we consider the many legacies that bring us together here today. Thank you, Cooper and Will. So we'll just take a moment to think of those legacies. Um, So now we're gonna turn the mic over to Alex and Rosie who are going to make our official welcome and introduction to Professor Chin. Hey Alex, uh, Rosie, excuse me. This year, we spend much of our time in our eighth grade history class exploring the ways in which decisions people have made have changed the course of history. Our teachers ask us to think about how if different decisions had been made, there might've been different outcomes. And they ask us to contemplate what decisions we might choose to make, given what we've learned. Today, we will hear from Professor Gabriel Jack Chin, a renowned scholar of immigration law, criminal procedure, and race and law, whose work often focuses on legal decisions and their outcomes. Together with his students at UC Davis Law School, he has produced groundbreaking work to redress historical wrongs, work which ultimately may help improve outcomes. Here are a few examples. Professor Chin and his students were in the news recently for their efforts to posthumously admit Hong Yen Chen, the first Chinese American lawyer in the, in the United States, to the California bar in 2015, some 125 years after he was denied entry because of his race. They have worked to repeal Jim Crow laws still in the books, such as the 2003 petition to the Ohio legislature to ratify the 14th Amendment 136 years after the state disapproved it during the eradication process. Another undertaking, this one focused on repealing anti-Asian alien laws, which were still in the books in Florida, Kansas, New Mexico, and Wyoming, led A Magazine to name Professor Chin one of the 25 most notable Asians in America. Professor Chin serves as the Edward L. Barrett Jr. Chair of Law, Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Law, and Director of Clinical Legal Education at UC Davis Law School. His scholarship has, a, has appeared in the Penn, UCLA, Cornell, and Harvard Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Reviews, and the Yale, Duke, and Georgetown Law Journals, among others. The US Supreme Court has cited his work, and he is a frequent commentator and or interviewee in the media, having recently been featured on NPR, ABC, NBC, and the History Channel, and in reporting from USA Today and the Associated Press. A member of the country school class of 1978, Professor Chin attended Kamenasset School and is a graduation of as a graduate of Wesleyan University, University of Michigan, and Yale University. We are happy to welcome you back to campus today. We look forward to learning more about your work and maybe a little bit about your life as a country school student. Thank you, Professor Chin. Welcome back and congratulations on receiving the 2020 Distinguished Alumni Award. Thanks. Thanks, Alex and Rosie and uh, Cooper and Will. And let's um, turn, turn the, the floor over to Professor Chin. We are so happy to have you here and, and can't wait to learn about your journey. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here. I, I really want to thank Head of School Fix, uh, my near classmate Liz Lightfoot, Cooper and Will, Alex and Rosie for those wonderful introductions. It's, it's so uh, wonderful to be virtually back on campus, uh, and particularly uh, to get this Distinguished Alumni Award, which I accept with pleasure and gratitude, because when I was a student at TCS, I think it's fair to say, if I'm going to be honest, I was not the most brilliant student at the time. And so to, to come back for something like this is, 
is really a treat. It's really a pleasure. Uh, uh, when I when I think about um, uh, my my educational career, I realize that since entering kindergarten in 1969, I have continuously been a student or teacher uh, for my entire life since then, except for six years practicing law full time. But other than that, I've been in school in one way or another. And so when I think about TCS, uh, it's, it's with some experience in the uh, academic realm that, that, uh, that I realize how appreciative I am for TCS. Uh, uh, so many of the teachers and other members of the community really modeled kindness, patience, teaching ability. When I, uh, I am thinking in particular of Mr. Masker, Mr. Morrison, uh, uh, Mr. Bradford, Mr. MacArthur, and I count Tom West in that group because uh, I knew him at Hammond Asset, but he had been a longtime member of the TCS community. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I've lived away from Connecticut for most of the, the, the last several decades, but I've followed the progress of TCS with great interest uh, and pleasure. My sister Betsy and I both uh, attended and it was an excellent school when we attended. But what gives me particular satisfaction is to see that the school has not rested on its laurels. The school has continued to think about how it can prepare students for uh, uh, lives of learning in, in better ways, uh, uh, in, in new ways. And so it's great to see new initiatives, new programs, and, and uh, uh, other uh, accomplishments at TCS. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my work. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm a law professor. Uh, I'm at the University of California Davis School of Law, which is pretty near Sacramento in Northern California. I teach criminal law, race and law and immigration. And in my career, in my job as a law professor, I'm supposed to spend 40% of my time teaching 40% of my time doing research, publishing research, and 20% of my time doing service to the university, to the legal profession, to the community at large. And the privilege and challenge of my job is uh, that I and my colleagues on the faculty uh, at most law schools have an enormous amount of discretion about how we do those things. We get to choose what we write about, to a significant extent, choose what we teach. I like to do hands-on things with my students. Uh, I like to, to uh, uh, get out there in the field. Uh, when I teach criminal procedure, uh, uh, I do a demonstration of search and seizure law with the police. I hope, can you see that? That's, that's me on the left doing a demonstration with the University Police Department. Uh, I decided to become a law professor because as I went through school, I came to the conclusion that Asian American legal history had been underexplored. I was an American history major at Wesleyan. I took uh, relevant courses at the University of Michigan Law School, but it seemed to me that the focus was almost exclusively on black white issues, the black-white paradigm, black-white race relations. Black-white issues are obviously tremendously important when thinking about history and race and law. The history of the slave trade, the institution of slavery, the Civil War, Reconstruction, the civil rights movement of the mid-20th century, all of these things are, are central to American history. But when I was in college and law school, I saw only hints, uh, only vague suggestions that there was a story of race and law beyond that. When I was a student, the legal status of Native Americans and of Asian Americans was only beginning to be explored. And I would say that to this day, it remains in its relatively early stages compared to the understanding 
of the African-American historical and legal experience. Now, my interest in this field as a lawyer and law professor uh, was perhaps inevitable because my own family was involved in this for a variety of ways. So the background of this is the beginning with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Federal law passed by Congress restricted Asian immigration until 1965. One of the few ways that an Asian person born overseas could get to the United States to live was as the child of a US citizen. Now, a person of Chinese ancestry born in the United States was a US citizen. And so if that person born in the United States had a child overseas, then the child would be a US citizen. Uh, a lot of the people who immigrated to the United States as children of US citizens were what came to be called paper sons. Paper sons were not actually the children of the US citizens who sponsored them. They were often, not always, but often, nephews, cousins, people from the village, or in some cases, complete strangers. They were what we would now call unauthorized migrants. My father's father, Frank Chin, was a paper son. Our real family name is Chu, not Chin. That was the way he could get to the United States, and he did. On my mother's side of the family, my fifth great uncle, John Percival Jones, represented Nevada in the United States Senate from 1873 to 1903. He was what we would now call a white nationalist. And he voted for the exclusion of Chinese from the United States among many other policies that we would now consider racist. On the floor of the US Senate in 1882, he made this argument about what the United States should do with Chinese immigrants. Does anybody pretend to tell me it is a blessing to this country that African Americans are here? It's no fault of ours that they're here and it's no fault of theirs. It's the fault of a past generation. But their presence here is a great misfortune to us today. And the question of the adjustment of the relations between the two races socially and politically is no nearer a settlement now than it, is, than it was the day Sumter was fired upon, the day the Civil War began. The Chinaman's race, is socially more incongruous to ours and less capable of assimilation with us than is the Negro race. What encouragement do we find in the history of our dealings with the Negro race or in our dealings with the Indian race to induce us to permit another race struggle in our midst? His argument uh, was indeed successful and represented United States policy for many decades after that. But but my grandfather's involvement in this and my great uncle's involvement in this, when I learned about it, I, I saw that the legal treatment of Asians was an important issue for both sides of my family. And, and this must be one of the reasons I was interested in understanding it. Uh, so so uh, as uh, Alex and Rosie mentioned, uh, one of the ways that I teach this material to my students is by working with them uh, uh, on actual laws and, uh, and actual problems that are still on the books and trying to get the powers that be, whether they're courts, legislatures, governors, uh, to change them. And, I, and, I, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of law uh, and I, and I apologize in advance because it's slightly complicated, but I hope I can make it clear. So the background of, of many of the things that I'm gonna talk about, the background of many of the aspects of the Asian American legal situation in the United States begins with the Naturalization Act of 1790. Now naturalization is a process by which somebody born in another country can come to the United States and become a United States citizen. And it was a very important goal of the revolutionary generation because the uh, British authorities restricted naturalization and would not uh, allow the population of the United States of the colonies to increase. And so this was a high priority for 
the new United States government. And this is the law that the first Congress passed. So this is the first Congress that was elected after the organization of the United States, the ratification of the United States Constitution. It, it was signed by some of the most important uh, uh, founders of our country, John Adams, George Washington, and Thomas Jefferson, the first three presidents of the United States. Uh, uh, and the Naturalization Act of 1790 allowed the naturalization of free white persons. So it's racially restricted. And naturalization was a much more important issue in 1790 and, and in the 19th century than it is now, because in many states, only citizens could own land. That was important when agriculture was a much more central part of the economy. Uh, many more jobs were associated with agriculture than, there are, than they are now. And in many states, only citizens could hold licenses, such as a license as a doctor or a lawyer. Now, in 1870, Congress made persons of African nativity and descent eligible to become a US citizen by naturalization. And in 1952, naturalization became entirely race neutral. But between 1790 and 1952, naturalization was racially restricted. And so the, the, the policy challenge that the government faced in this period was that many states and the United States itself wanted to encourage immigration from Europe so they didn't want to discriminate against all non-citizens. They didn't want to discourage Europeans from owning land or holding government licenses. But at the same time, they didn't want to encourage non-white immigration. So how did the government thread that needle? Well, one way is that they gave away land to whites or immigrants who uh, who were white, who could become citizens. So this is the Donation Land Act of 1850, the Oregon Territory, which is much of the Pacific Northwest now. Uh, and there was free land available, but only for white settlers. But it wasn't just restricted to citizens. It, it was available to a citizen of the United States or somebody who was in the process of becoming a citizen. Uh, uh, another thing that happened was that 15 states passed laws allowing non-citizens who were racially eligible to citizenship to become, uh, to own land. That is to say, white immigrants were allowed to own land in the state and others were not. Uh, these were called the alien land laws. They started in California and expanded to, to most of the Western United States, 15 states ultimately, had these alien land laws, which prevented Asians from owning land. When my students and I started working on the project, we found that Florida, Kansas, New Mexico, and Wyoming still had anti-Asian alien land laws still on the books. We prepared papers for the governor and legislatures of those states, asked them to repeal the laws, and ultimately all of them did. We wanted to get publicity. We wanted people to learn about these laws. So we tried to get stories in the media, stories in the radio, stories on television, and, and we did. My feeling was that even most legal scholars and most historians didn't know much about the alien land laws, yet they were widespread and we wanted people to know more about them. Another project we did involved another consequence of ineligibility to citizenship. Even under the days of Chinese exclusion, uh, which later became Asian exclusion, it applied not just to Chinese, but to Japanese, Asian Indians, uh, Filipinos, and other Asians. So generally, Asians couldn't immigrate, but there was an exception for merchants, students, and scholars who could at least visit the United States. One visitor who ended up spending most of his life here was a student named Hung Yen Chang. Mr. Chang attended Phillips Andover Academy in the 1870s. He then went to Yale College and he graduated from Columbia Law School in 1886. He wanted to become a member of the New York Bar. 
But to be a bar member, one had to be a US citizen and that was impossible for him. However, he had connections from his schooling and that helped. One of his, uh, the father of one of his Yale classmates was the speaker of the New York House of Representatives. And he arranged to have a special law passed to allow Hong Yen Chang as an individual to take the New York bar examination and become admitted to the bar. And as a result, he became the first Chinese American lawyer in the United States. A couple of years later, Mr. Chang wanted to practice law in California, but in 1890, the California Supreme Court excluded him because of his race in a case called In Re Hung Yen Chang, which was published in the official California law reports. Uh, Mr. Chang passed away in the 1920s, but a few years ago, my students and I petitioned the California Supreme Court to posthumously admit him to the bar, and they did. Another project I did with a student was published as an article called The War Against Chinese Restaurants. This was traditional academic research. And what I am going to say will sound absurd as it did to me at first. But in our research, we found a decades long, theretofore unreported effort driven by labor unions to eliminate Chinese restaurants from the United States. The Cooks and Waiters Union uh, was the a leader in this effort. Um, and uh, an executive of that union explained the rationale for trying to eliminate Chinese restaurants. Viewed, viewing this matter from every angle, without heat or racial prejudice, the fact stares us in the face that there's a conflict between the American wage earner and the workers from the Orient. Our government has been compelled to close its doors to Asiatics in recognition of this fact. There were many different techniques used to combat uh, the Chinese restaurants, including boycotts, um, urging people not to go to Chinese restaurants, discriminatory law enforcement, discriminatory license denial. But the most interesting to me was a law that was introduced in several states that was designed to prohibit white women from working or eating in Chinese restaurants. This was a resolution of the American Federation of Labor passed at their 1913 convention. And it said that, that moral and economic evils arose from having white women in Chinese restaurants. Uh, this represented a serious menace to society and so the law should prohibit it. Uh, the economic evil was competition that if Chinese were allowed to have restaurants that competed with white restaurants, then the owners of white restaurants and workers in white restaurants would have less of an opportunity to earn a living. The moral menace to society that the American Federation of Labor mentioned was the idea that white women coming into contact with Chinese restaurants uh, could lead to their immorality. It could corrupt them in various ways. And so here's an article from the Washington Times uh, uh, that's, that says society should step in and prevent young white girls from wrecking themselves by coming into contact with Asians. Every state in the union should pass laws that would prohibit a white girl from ever crossing a Chinaman's threshold. Some jurisdictions did this uh, uh, and, and there was a serious sense as reported in the newspapers that there was a tremendous moral threat here. In, in Connecticut, in Bridgeport, a paper reported that many a young girl received her first lesson in sin in Chinese restaurants. The California newspaper said beer and noodles in Chinese joints have caused the downfall of countless American girls. The Chicago Tribune reported police statistics that allegedly showed more than 300 Chicago white girls had succumbed to the influence of the chop suey joints. The, the report said vanity and the desire for showy clothes led to their downfall. 
as they smoked, drank, and permitted themselves to be hypnotized by the dreamy, seductive music that was always on tap. Now, as you know, the effort to eliminate Chinese restaurants didn't work. I assume that all of you have gone to or at least seen Chinese restaurants. Uh, and as I think about these historical events, it's very clear that things have changed. Hong Yan Chang never got admitted to the California bar, <coughs> excuse me, but his niece did. He has a niece named Rochelle Chong, and she was able to become a lawyer, and she became the first Asian American federal communications commissioner. She had and is having a great career. Uh, uh, the court that admitted Hong Yan Chang to the bar had a chief justice who was an Asian American, another justice, Goodwin Liu, who's Asian American, and other people of color on the court as well. And so uh, uh, I think what can be said about a lot of these historical forms of discrimination against uh, uh, Asians is that they are part of the dustbin of history. On the other hand, I really appreciate the question that the eighth grade history class has been thinking about, and that is how, how could some of these choices have been made differently? And if they were, what would the United States look like today? And, and uh, I, I wanna very briefly suggest to you that the, the ideology and the legal measures that I've alluded to briefly in this talk are not completely gone. We still are living with the consequences of them today. And I'm gonna offer you a couple of reasons which I want you to think about. Uh, it's up to you to decide whether the evidence that I offer leads to the conclusion or not. The first thing that I wanna say is that I submit to you that whatever the success and failure of individual anti-Asian measures, and many of them failed, overall, the anti-Asian campaign worked. Asians are half the population of the world. They were in the 1880s, they are now. The United States is a nation of immigrants, but less than 1% of the US population was of Asian ancestry in 1960. It's five or 6% today. The central goal of all of the anti-Asian laws in the United States was to exclude Asians from the opportunities here and I submit to you that its effects are felt to this day. The second thing that I propose to you is that we see the reasoning of anti-Asian measures persisting today. The exclusion of Asians from immigration and from naturalization was based on an idea of ineradicable racial foreignness. The point was not that Congress wanted to make sure that immigrants or citizens had good moral character, that they spoke English, that they weren't communists, that they could support themselves or whatever characteristics we think make good immigrants. The point was that if you were Asian, even if all of those things were true, even if you were a graduate of Andover, Yale College and Columbia Law School, none of those individual characteristics could overcome what really mattered, the key thing that the country was looking for in immigrants. Uh, there was nothing that can be done about Asian-ness. Uh, one representative in Congress said, alien in manners, servile in labor, pagan in religion, they are fundamentally un-American. Our civilization, which is the most potent in the world in blotting out race distinctions and amalgamating nationalities, is utterly powerless to efface in a single aspect the primeval national characteristics of the Chinaman. He is literally ironclad to the genius of our institutions. He is the same unadulterated Mongolian on the banks of the Sacramento River as he is on the Long He. So I submit to you that there are consequences of this today. Uh, race matters. We are now in the pandemic experiencing a wave of anti-Asian harassment, violence, and even murder. If the Chinese government or the Chinese Communist Party is responsible to some degree for the COVID-19 pandemic, then they're gonna to have to answer for that. But I think it's illogical to blame Chinese people or Chinese Americans in the United States who weren't there and had nothing to do with it. It's even more illogical to blame the Korean Americans, the Filipino Americans, 
and the Latinos in the United States who have been mistaken for Asians and yet have been subject to street harassment. But it makes sense. If the ideology that led to Chinese exclusion is, is right, that Asians are all roughly the same and they're the same whether they're here or there, that I think uh, uh, makes what's going on more understandable. Okay, I'm sorry, I've gone on so long. I will uh, stop there and, and I would, uh, I, I hope we have time for questions. Thank you. We do have time for questions. I need to give you your award, but maybe we move straight to questions. And um, if people need to peel off for, for field day, they can. Um, but, but let's move to questions. And Marina, um, if you would like to be our moderator, you can. Um, um, you know, kids or um, folks, if you want to, uh, to speak, you can come up and, and unmute if you have a question you'd like to ask. But we also can use the chat. Perhaps while people are thinking of their questions, I could ask uh, a question. I always have a question. So I will ask the first question and then in all the Zoom boxes, someone else is next. Um, thank you so much for, for being here this morning. That was, that was amazing. Um, and I uh, just recently had the privilege, I'm in Florida, everyone. So I'm not in Connecticut, but I just recently had the privilege of watching my partner and their family get US citizenship and um, helping them study for the test brought back a lot of memories of not paying attention in history class. And I was curious about um, if you know just about the, the kind of origin of the questions because some of them seemed really like I failed, you know, like I failed the test every time I asked them all the questions and then I eventually kind of got it once I learned. But um, I was just wondering if you knew in connection to the kind of histories and discourses that you just traced um, the origin of those questions, or if you have kind of any comment on, on how that test was structured in relation to your kind of legal knowledge. So the, the, the questions have been controversial in recent years, and uh, uh, they've been changed administration by administration. And the, administ the, the most recent uh, past administration completely revamped the citizenship test. Uh, and, and I think inevitably it was controversial. Uh, and, I, and I say inevitably because uh, there's some contestation about what core American values are and about what core uh, uh, aspects of US history uh, and the structure of government are the most important. Uh, and, and so there, there was a, a complete revamp um, uh, 18 months or two years ago, uh, and there were a lot of uh, objections to it. On the other hand, this is a test, unlike the SAT or the ACT, where the answers, the questions and answers are available. <laughs> and so, it's, uh, so it, it is a test that people can study for and, and, and memorize the answers to. Uh, uh, and, and so people are able to pass. And I, and I will also say that in one of the more humane measures, there's also a provision of law that says that if somebody is because of age or because of some other uh, characteristic, they are, they are cognitively unable to pass the exam, they don't, they don't have to pass it. So, uh, uh, so it's not an insuperable barrier for everybody. Thank you. Um, we have some questions in the chat. The first question is about your Zoom background. Is it related to something that you're working on? What's the connection with, with the background? So this is the courtyard of the UC Davis Law School and uh, the building is called King Hall. Um, uh, named after Dr. King, of course, and we have a number of mementos of his uh, of his life, and one of them is this mural, which 
which uh, is only a couple of years old. Um, we haven't had time to enjoy it much because of the pandemic, but uh, uh, I use it as, uh, as my Zoom background. And you know, the University of California Davis Law School is self-consciously a, a social justice law school. That's something that we focus on here. Listen, we are happy to send people to corporations, big law firms. Certainly every student's allowed to do whatever they want uh, when they graduate and for that matter, while they're in school. But uh, uh, it is something that we, that we uh, uh, specialize in nonetheless. That's a great um, connection to our next question from the Lew Advisory Zoom Room. Um, and they wrote, it's exciting that you get law students involved in projects that make a real difference. Would you say that's typical in a law program or something unique to UC Davis? I, I wouldn't say it's unique to UC Davis. Um, um, in recent years, it, it, the, the, really the past two generations uh, of law students, there's been more and more clinical education, more and more of a sense that lawyers should be trained like doctors and have hands-on experience while they're in law school. Uh, and, and so law, many, many law schools, virtually all law schools have opportunities to work on real cases and work on real projects while you are a student. Uh, uh, and so uh, hundreds of law students all over the country, for example, worked on, uh, including at UC Davis, worked on matters related to the Muslim ban when that uh, uh, started four and a half years ago. Uh, and, and so it, it's not just UC Davis, it's, it's lots of other places. Awesome. Do other folks have questions? Feel free to send them directly to me in the chat or unmute yourselves and ask Professor Chen. I had a question while others are chatting in of uh, how much of your students studied the internment of uh, Japanese Americans in particular um, during, the, during the war. Well, that is particularly because of the Muslim ban, the, the Japanese American incarceration is, a, is more and more uh, uh, studied in almost every constitutional law class. Uh, uh, and, and certainly every, every race and law class. Uh, and so, so, so I think from the time when I went to law school, where, where, where it, it was mentioned, I think the difference between when I went to law school and now is that when I went to law school, the Japanese American incarceration was mentioned, but it wasn't really contextualized. It wasn't really made clear that it was part of a long uh, 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 history of, uh, of racial regulation of Asians uh, that continued for for a decade afterwards. Um, on the other hand, I will say that the that the situation is is it, it would be a mistake to think of the situation as one of sort of unrelieved racial oppression. Uh, there was always at, at almost every period of American history a debate. There were always people who objected. To racial discrimination, uh, white people included, and and I'm and I, I, there's a, a project I'm working on with a student now, actually a former student. Now she's a lawyer. She's graduated, uh, but another aspect of Asian American legal history that that we found that had never been written about in the legal literature is that that it turns out that after the Japanese American incarceration and the Japanese returned to California, there was a feeling of regret uh, on the part of, of the people of California. Uh, and in 1951, the California legislature uh, 
voluntarily, not through any sort of legal obligation, they voluntarily voted reparations uh, to Japanese American um, uh, landowners who had lost their land uh, because of the alien land laws. And so uh, uh, I, I told you that there were these alien land laws that prohibited Asians from owning land. Uh, one of the ways they got around that was to put the land in the names of their US citizen children who were born in the United States and legally allowed to own land. California, in many cases, took the land from them anyway uh, uh, through lawsuits. But in 1951, they gave all the money back because they recognized that it was regrettable. Uh, uh, and so, you know, uh, uh, for me, understanding the details of what happened, understanding the specifics of what happened, it's, it's not all grim. Uh, sometimes there are good parts of the story as well. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> So um, I actually sort of have a question on that on that note. Um, I think when we were con we were speaking um, prior to this meeting, you, you talked about the notion of hope. Um, how do you feel about um, uh, we? And because actually we had some debates about this in our in our history class. Are we are we a country where we're always going to be struggling with these issues? Maybe so. Are we? Are they going to get better? Um, how do you stand on on the notion of you know the um, bending towards justice argument? Well, so, sort of my grand view of history is, is that we're, that, that this is the time of testing. Uh, if you look at social change in certain other countries, uh, there, are, there are transitional moments uh, uh, where there's a, a new agreed upon new set of values. And I don't think that we had that. Uh, we had, of course, a catastrophic civil war, but it didn't lead to um, um, a change in views. Uh, there was a winner and a loser, sort of, but, um, but the uh, African Americans were not accepted as full citizens, uh, uh, notwithstanding the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. It didn't happen. Uh, when we had this, the second reconstruction, the Civil Rights Revolution of the 1960s, I think that was an elite movement. And what I mean by that is, uh, uh, the, the 1965 Immigration Act, for example, eliminated racial restrictions on immigration uh, for Asians, but it wasn't popular. The, there, there was no, according to survey data, there was no groundswell of, of the American population that said, hey, let's, it's time to get rid of this. Uh, on the whole, people were happy with a system that generated primarily white immigration. Uh, and the same is true of, of some of the other um, things that happened uh, uh, in terms of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, th there's a, a case from, from the Mississippi Supreme Court in 1964 that, that to me is really telling about the sort of cultural political changes of that period. And this was a case where freedom riders who were mainly people from the North, different races, white, black, other, who desegregated buses and transportation facilities like bus stations by getting on a bus in the North and driving through the South. And there was a lot of hostility and resentment uh, in segregated facilities. 
and sometimes mobs would uh, would burn the buses, attack the freedom riders, et cetera. And Knight versus State was a case where a bunch of freedom riders were arrested and imprisoned for disorderly conduct because they refused to to leave segregated facilities when a white mob threatened them. And the police, instead of saying, instead of protecting them from the white mob, they they told the freedom riders to leave or they would be arrested and they were arrested. And, and this case is interesting to me because it, it's a unanimous decision of the Mississippi Supreme Court. And the Mississippi Supreme Court is an elected court, which is to say the justices are, are, are politicians, nothing, nothing wrong with that. Um, but one thinks that as elected judges, they might have some sense of what the people want and what the people believe. And, and in this opinion, they sort of explain why they, you know, they don't understand uh, uh, about school desegregation and desegregation of bus stations and all that. And there's this line uh, uh, at the end, large numbers of people in this broad land are steeped in their customs, practices, mores, and traditions. In many instances, their beliefs go as deeper, deeper than religion itself. This, the, every one of these people is a, a justices is a Christian, can't, can't get elected unless you're a member in good standing of a, a Christian church in, in, in Mississippi, uh, at least in 1964. And so they're saying, um, we, you know, there's the law and we're going to do our best to follow it, but other people, you need to understand that the, our beliefs in racial segregation go as deep or deeper than religion itself. And what is the moment when that changed? Uh, uh, I, I don't think it did in the civil rights movement any more than it did after the Civil War. And so I think right now, right now is when we're having the debate. Right now is when the United States is trying to decide uh, uh, with, with uh, views being frankly articulated on both sides. Uh, people like, uh, like Amy Wax, who's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, uh, who says quite frankly, look, America is gonna work better if we have immigrants from places who share our Western Enlightenment political values. And if you have people who come from less educated authoritarian countries, how are they supposed to work uh, out in our country of freedom? And my answer is, you know, gee whiz, people have integrated and assimilated and proved to be good Americans regardless of their race or religion before, and they'll continue to do it. But I think what, what is at issue and what's being asked is, you know, can we, can we really have a multi-racial, multi-religion democracy uh, uh, in, which, in which the majority of the American people are willing to accept the consequences of that? And, and, and I, you know, as a prediction, I would say, I think they will. I think the, the, um, the, the traditions of the United States, the, the experiences that we've had, the political values, uh, you know, say that, that we can handle this. But uh, uh, at the same time, uh, there are powerful arguments against it uh, 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 as well. So, so uh, you know, I, I think this is the moment. This is the this is a turning point because so we've never had, uh, 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 I think, uh, the situation that we're in where there's certainly the potential uh, that that people of color could hold the balance of political power. People of color could be making uh, economic and, and educational and, and social advances 
of a type that has not happened in the past. Um, uh, and, and, and whether the American people as a whole will accept it, I think they will, but it's an open question. We had one more quick question, and then I, I know people need to run, um, but uh, Tosh, I wanted to be able to ask your question. Um, quickly, is it, he asks, why do you think, why do you think co uh, COVID didn't decrease racial tension? Did that, I'm sorry. Why do you think COVID did not decrease racial tensions by fighting against a common enemy? Because we, oh, I it's as much. Sorry, I was going to say that's so like wow. <laughs> that is okay, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I would say because we see racial tensions more in situations where there is anxiety and economic uncertainty, and people are concerned about their own position and their own situation, uh, and and because of all the economic disruption. I mean, it was really scary with the level of unemployment there for a while and the businesses that had to close. The, our, our, my school and your school you know, can't operate in person. What are we gonna do? Uh, uh, so I, I think there was, an, there was an enormous amount of anxiety. And for some people, certainly not all. For some people that manifested itself in increased racial tension. I think for other people, though, uh, there, there was a recognition that we're all in this together and we're all gonna have to work together. And, uh, and if we don't, we're gonna be much weaker and much worse off.